This is Road Noise, episode number 18, Living with Someone Who Suffers from Clinical Depression. This is a powerful one, and it's coming up in this episode of Road Noise, Life One Mile at a Time. Hello again, and thanks for joining me one more time for Road Noise Life One Mile at a Time. I'm your host, Michael Blackston, and you're sitting in the passenger seat alongside me as I commute to and from work all over the southeast United States. If you're hearing something under the sound of my voice, well, that's just the noise of the road. That's why we call this show Road Noise, because it was kind of a clever way to uh, answer the question of why I couldn't uh, get that noise out from under the sound of my voice in post-production. Hey, we'll call it road noise and everything will be good. They'll understand and it'll work and it'll be great. My wife thought it was clever and she thought it was cute and actually used the word charming, I believe, when she was listening to the tests. So that's what you're hearing. I hope you enjoy this podcast and if you do, tell your friends about it. We are going to talk today about a couple of different things. First of all, this, if you are new to the show, this is a Life Journal podcast. My name is Michael Blackston, as I said before, and this is my Life Journal. This is me talking to the future, well, the present and the future, to listeners now. And it's something for my family and my children and grandchildren and their children and grandchildren to have, hopefully, that they'll something they're, they'll care about on down the line from me. And uh, also, it's for your benefit. Now, there have been a couple of things that I wanted to change. This this has been an interesting couple of days for me. This week started out at the end of the week for my work week. I didn't have to work except Thursday and Friday. I was supposed to work on Wednesday, come home for Thursday, and then work again on Friday. But the company that I was going to be working for on Wednesday called and said, could you come on Thursday instead? I said, that'll be fine. I knew I'd have a lot of driving around to do all at once if I did that, but that was okay. And I said, that's fine. But then when I got to the place where I was going to be doing my etching job, they told me that there were two more color portraits on the stone than they had anticipated, which meant I was not going to be able to get that job done in one single day. That meant I was going to have to reschedule, because this was in Winsboro, South Carolina, and I was going to turn around and drive all the way to Birmingham, Alabama on today, which is Friday, while I'm recording this, and uh, I had to reschedule the Alabama trip, which was okay. I'm supposed to go to Alabama next week anyway, so I'll just add that job in there. But it was kind of a mess. But before I got to the job on Thursday morning yesterday, I recorded episode number 18 of Road Noise. Well, Michael, I think you just said at the intro that this was episode number 18. You're right, it is. I have scrapped that episode that I recorded, at least as an official episode. It is going to be released as a bonus episode. It's all about how to start your own blog. And the reason I scrapped it was because as I started listening back to it in post-production and cutting out the ums and the uhs and stuff like that and just doing the things that I have to do for post-production, I was listening to it and I just didn't like it. I, I, well, let me take that back. I, it wasn't that I didn't like it. It was just that I didn't like it for a road noise normal episode. The first thing I did was I told you in that episode, and I'm going to tell you now, that I'm going to be trying my best to keep it as close to 30 minutes from now on as I can. I think that's a good time for you to listen to me prattle on about my life. Now, this episode will probably be longer because it's got a lot of content and I've got a lot to say about it. But a normal episode, I'm going to try to keep in the ballpark of 30, I imagine it may go closer to 45 minutes, but I'm going to try to keep them to about 30 minutes, and we'll see how it goes from there. And I also mentioned that I'm trying to keep things topical in a way that it's not just me talking about things you couldn't possibly be interested in. Yes, I'll talk about things that I have experience in and they are parts of my life, but at the same time, there's something that you can come away from the podcast at the end of it and say, wow, I learned something from that. I can apply that to my own life. And so I really want, although the, I want this podcast to be something of a journal and a, an audio diary, at the same time, I want it to be valuable to you. And that's why I went with the whole blog topic. And that is important to me, but just listening to it, it just ended up sounding a little too, I guess what I'm trying to say is I wanted it to be more conversational. And that one just wasn't. So I'm releasing it as a bonus episode. 
So what about today? Today we're going to get kind of heavy, but it's something that is on my heart, and it is going to be conversational. I'm just going to tell you about my life dealing with this particular topic, and I want to say right from the start that I did ask my wife before I did this, as I was coming up with ideas for this podcast, I asked her if she would mind, first of all, if I ventured into this topic, and second of all, if I ventured into it, did she want to be with me as part of the podcast, or did she just want me to go ahead and do it by myself? Did she trust me enough? Because this is a very personal topic for she and I. She and I, is that right? Me and her, me and she, whatever the correct grammar is for that. For us, it is a very personal topic, and it's the topic of clinical depression. We have a lot of experience in this now. Kayla and I have been married for almost 21 years. In March, it will be 21 years. And the first half of that, maybe a little more than the first half, but I I think it's been about the first half of it, somewhere close. Kayla and I had issues because of what we found later turned out to be that she suffers from clinical depression. Now, I'm a very positive person. I'm upbeat. I'm always wanting to be the guy that makes you laugh. And even if I'm hurting, if I'm bleeding from every pore of my body and you ask me how I'm feeling, I'm going to tell you, I'm all right. I'm good. Let's laugh. Let's have fun. That's just me. I'm a very positive person. I don't deal well with negativity. And from the time Kayla and I started dating, I used to say, She's just a negative person. And to be honest with you, it kind of baffled me how I fell so madly in love with her. With me being such a positive-minded person, my glass is always half full. Hers always seemed like it was half empty. And it it really kind of blew my mind that I fell so madly in love with her with us being on opposite ends of the spectrum. We were so alike in so many other ways, and God put us together. I fully believe that this was God's plan for me and Kayla to be together, but this became an issue. Even before we got married, we had some major fights about her attitude and the way she was, would talk to me and the way she would think about things. Even we would fight about the way she thought about things because I didn't, I had a hard time handling it. But it was the type of thing that we felt like we could work through in our marriage because we knew that Even if we got married, there were always going to be problems we had to work through. There was never going to be a marriage that was just perfect from day one and remain perfect as far as your experiences day in and day out. That's why those vows are like they are, for better or for worse. And we figured that this particular situation, me being a positive type person and she being a negative type person, was not the type of thing not to get married over because we were on the same page with all of the important things. Well, as our marriage progressed, we had more and more fights because, well, you know how it is. As you become more used to each other and you've gotten married and you're not courting, you're not trying to necessarily every single day put on your best for her. She's not trying to put on her best for you. Although, ideally, If you love someone, you would want to put on your best for them every day. You kind of get numb as the years go along. And things get a little harder to deal with, a little harder to take, a little more irritable. You get a little more irritable. Things irritate you more. And it got to the point after 10 years of marriage that we had some doozies of fights based on things that I thought she was going way overboard with that I thought were nothing she was angry that I didn't take things as seriously as she thought I should and it just all culminated till one day Kayla said I want to get seen about and I said what do you mean she said I want to go and get evaluated she said I have a family history of 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 clinical depression I want to see if All of these symptoms that seem to point that way are accurate, and I don't want to self-diagnose. I'd rather go to a professional and be diagnosed and find out whether I suffer from clinical depression because really, most of the time when I feel the way I am that have caused so many problems in our marriage, and let me back up and say that she and I have always had a great marriage. It's never been that we were on the cusp of divorce or anything like that. It's just 
there were things that rubbed us raw and if you are someone who has clinical depression and it's undiagnosed and you're just living with it without any help and you're just trying to slog through the mud of it all by yourself with no help it gets very frustrating and very stressful and it can start physically affecting you and she was starting to feel some of those physical effects high blood pressure all kinds of different things and she knew she needed to go be seen about and make sure that she wasn't suffering this and hadn't all her life had these feelings due to cl clinical depression she went and got looked at and that's exactly the diagnosis from the professionals was that she suffered clinical depression and like I said it didn't come as any sort of a surprise to her because she'd had some of that in her family she'd always known a little bit about that here and there but it wasn't anything she really thought of as herself so she got on some medication and started kind of going through the process of figuring out what she needed to take how she needed to take it what was going to work for her what was not and let me tell you that from the moment we got the diagnosis and the moment she started getting good, honest, professionally guided medical attention for her clinical depression, it completely changed our marriage. I won't say she no longer suffered any of the symptoms. The symptoms sometimes can be hard to cover up, it can be hard to to tamp down even with the medication but the difference was amazing and it made all the difference in the world in our marriage because I never stopped loving my wife but the difference I saw in her personality in her happiness was amazing suddenly she could drive down the road without getting so angry that she wanted to ram the car in front of her she could go into a grocery store and someone being in her way so that she had to go down to the next aisle and come back up, it didn't really bother her like it would have. Suddenly she wasn't feeling worthless. She had purpose in her own mind. Things seemed positive. She wasn't as negative as she seemed to always be before that and again it would be better coming from her but I don't you know my wife she just isn't into podcasts and she's not really the kind of person who wants to sit in front of a mic and, and do this type of thing she gave me the permission to talk about this and I think it's important very important that it is talked about especially for people who are thinking maybe they're going through it or especially I'm talking I, I, I topic titled this how to live or living with someone who suffers clinical depression because I, that's where I'm coming from and that's why it's not really I'm not gonna give you the mindset of someone who suffers from it because I do not I'm gonna give you the mindset of someone who has lived with it for a while I've been the recipient of ups and I've been the recipient of downs as far as being on the outside looking in and having the experience of dealing with the woman I love having to go through this and it's not easy and honestly from everything I've seen her case I won't say is mild but it's nowhere near as extreme as a lot of people's I'm gonna mention some symptoms in just a little bit and they're not symptoms that fully encompass the entire list of symptoms that go along with clinical depression but they are some of the ones that either we have dealt with or that I just happen to know through research and studying are parts of symptoms of clinical depression and things you might want to look out for and I'm gonna mention which ones were Kayla's and which ones were not Kayla's because I don't want her listening back to this and going oh you didn't make it clear I never thought that way you know so I, I, I know which ones Kayla suffered and which ones she did not but are also symptoms that you can look out for so I just kinda wanna make that clear before I start so let's jump into this because this could possibly be a fairly long episode I don't wanna gloss over anything that's important but at the same time I don't wanna just stay on and on the same thing and I wanna try to make this episode as quick and efficient as possible without leaving out any value for you 
So this is this is how it relates to me personally. Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention some signs that you might look out for if you think at all that either you are going through it and you need to get help, or maybe you're thinking that sounds like someone I know. Because I know a lot of times people self-diagnose themselves uh, or they'll just assume. It's kind of like me with my OCD. I say I'm OCD. Well, you know what? I have some quirky little things, but I probably would not be diagnosed as officially OCD because everybody calls themselves that now, and I can live without something being straight. I don't like it. It bothers me a little bit, but that's all it is. I don't think I would necessarily call myself OCD. And so there are a lot of people who say they're clinically depressed when they're not. They're just dealing with other things. So what I want to suggest later on will be about how to go about figuring out if you really are someone who suffers from clinical depression. So please at least stay, stay with me through this because it could be important to you. So if you or someone you love show these signs, it might be something to think about. And it's not necessarily one sign or all signs. They can be any number of mixture mashup of these. But some of the signs to look out for, somebody might want to stay in bed all the time. Not only do you feel tired all the time, but you just don't feel like getting out of bed. It's hard to make yourself get out of bed. Look out for that if that's something that describes you or someone you love. Also, mood swings, massive mood swings. One minute they're fine, the next minute they're crying or just seeming depressed. Exceptionally impatient. So far, those first three things have described the symptoms that my wife has suffered. My wife, since I've known her, has been exceptionally impatient to the point that if whatever she needed or wanted wasn't done half a second from the moment she mentioned it, she got not only irritated, but angry, really angry. So that's why I put the word exceptionally impatient. We all get impatient nowadays, especially in this day and time where everybody wants the fastest internet speed and stuff like that, and there are too many cars on the road. Everybody talks about having road rage. I'm not talking about your normal stuff that we deal with as a culture. I'm talking about exceptionally impatient. And if you experience it, then it will hit you like a ton of bricks. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Sad without knowing why. This is another one that my wife does suffer when she's having a bout of clinical depression symptoms. Now, this next one is not anything Kayla has suffered, at least. So she's told me that she has not, and I do believe her. Uh, suicidal thoughts. If you know someone or you yourself are, think about suicide a lot, uh, even especially if it's something that is considered. That's definitely something you want to talk to somebody about a sign you want to look out for. Kayla never went that far, had that problem, but it perhaps one of the reasons is because we did eventually catch it and figure out how to help her manage it. Feeling worthless, however, is something that Kayla still struggles with. That's one of the symptoms that comes up a lot. Even when she's on her medication, she'll feel absolutely worthless. And I'll ask her why. Some, did something happen? No, I just, I can't tell you why. I just don't feel like I'm worth anything. It kind of goes along with being sad without knowing why. It's just they, they can't tell you why. There's no rhyme or reason for it. It's just the way they feel. Emotional eating. Now, this could be a symptom of a lot of different things, not just clinical depression, but it is definitely something that people will try to, the self-medication that I've told you about, they'll try to fix how they're feeling bad by eating and it comes across from an emotional state of mind. So emotional eating is something you want to look at and then of course, again now, Kayla never hurt herself, but self-harm, things like cutting, anything that would cause harm to them that's not going as far as suicide but they're doing damage, physical damage to their bodies. Uh, if you're doing that or you know someone who's doing that, that might be a sign of clinical depression, among other things. If you see that, obviously that's serious and needs to be taking care of and looked into 
whether it's from clinical depression or not. But those are just some of the signs. I'm going to read through them once again. Somebody might want to stay in bed. They have mood swings, exceptionally impatient, sad without knowing why, suicidal thoughts, feeling worthless, emotional eating, and self-harm. Those are just some of the symptoms that I've come across. I have a feeling there's probably a list a mile long of these, a bunch of stuff that I didn't mention. And if you do feel like you would like to mention some of these or have something to say about this, for one thing, Road Noise, I would love for it to be a sounding board for you. If you don't want anything mentioned on the show, just all you got to do is say it in the voicemail or in the email that you don't wish this to be talked about on the show. But if you need a voice or need an ear to listen to, you need to vent to somebody, I'm okay with that, and I will go ahead and give you our feedback. Email address is feedback at michaelblackston.com. That's feedback at michaelblackston.com. That's new, by the way. I just started that, but that's where I want you to go to from now on. Also, the uh, voicemail number is 706-389-0401. That's 706-389-0401. So if you ever feel like you need to talk something out regarding this type of thing, I'm not going to answer the phone that goes straight to a voicemail and I'm not going to reply right the second you hit send but I will reply to you and I will be an ear for you and it's somebody I, I will come at you as someone who has been there as someone who has loved and does love someone who suffers from clinical depression so I, I have I have experience in this so here's, here's what I want you to do, and again, I'm coming from you to you from someone who does not suffer but is madly in love with and lives with someone who does suffer clinical depression. If you recognize some of those symptoms and you say to yourself, I've never understood why, but you know what, maybe that's something we need to look out to that or look out for, that's what I want you to do. I want you to go seek some some professional aid. You need to keep in mind clinical depression is a chemical imbalance of the brain. It does not mean you're crazy. What it means is, I can't remember what the name of the chemical is that your body produces that creates happiness and thoughts, but there's a chemical that your brain produces that balances out your negative thoughts with your happy thoughts and when your brain creates the chemical more of the negative than it does of the positive you have an imbalance and you feel more negative you feel more depressed you feel more worthless because your brain is producing more of that chemical that creates those feelings within you now I understand we we have minds and things make us sad but I'm talking about your everyday go-to attitude if it's more negative because of this chemical being produced more of on that side of the brain or in that scientifically I'm not sure how it all works I just know that the the chemical that is produced that makes you feel good and makes you feel happy is less than the other what happens is when you get a medication it balances out and that and that's what the doctor is supposed to help you do is balance out you don't want to feel so happy that things are dangerous. You don't want to feel dangerously happy either. You want a good balance. You want to be able to be realistic, but at the same time, you want to be happy. You want to be able to handle things the way your body and brain was meant to. So you're not crazy if you have to get medication. It doesn't mean you're a nut job. It means you need some medication to help balance out the way it's supposed to be. It's nothing to be self conscious of at all and a professional can help you with that so if you think that you need to see someone professionally call your doctor tell them what you're thinking and set up an appointment they'll be glad to walk you through it I want you to avoid self-medication though because that is something so many people do especially people who don't have insurance and nowadays that's a big issue I understand I'm my own boss and until recently we didn't have health insurance and that was an issue it's always been an issue with our medical care. Up until now, it is definitely worth the doctor's visit. Don't seek self-medication. You can harm yourself that way. 
you can become addicted to whatever you're doing. Just just don't self-medicate. Don't self-diagnose. If this is something you seriously think that you have a problem with or you know someone who does, get professional medical attention for it. Now, this is the part where I want to move on into only talking to the people who are living with someone who deals with clinical depression. Because up till now, this could have gone both ways. This could be something that you're listening to because you suffer from it, or as a listener, you're thinking, that might be me. Or it could be somebody who just lives with someone who suffers from it. But now I'm going to be specific talking to those who are in my shoes. You live with someone who has been diagnosed as clinically depressed. Or even if you they haven't been and you suspect it, you can go ahead and start adding these attitudes to your relationship with this person and it will go miles to help it. And I wish that 10 years ago we had, no, 20 years ago, we had known what we know now. And these are things that you really, honestly, whether the person you're dealing with has clinical depression or not, this is the way, really, as people who live with each other, we should be behaving towards one another anyway. This is kind of a breakdown of the golden rule when it comes to someone who is having emotional issues. So if you suspect or you know someone is dealing with clinical depression and you need to have a relationship with them, here are the things I want you to keep in mind. And this is very important because this goes to their well-being and your well-being because it will make you feel better as well. First thing you want to do is do not react negatively when you are on the receiving end of an attack. In other words, if someone is suffering about a clinical depression and they're kind of you're, you're feeling like you're the punching bag, try your best to not react negatively. I'm not saying you need to be a doormat. I'm not saying that at all. It needs to be addressed. You can't just take punches and take punches and never address the situation. I understand that. But at the same time, you need to be aware of where it's coming from. Nine times out of ten, with clinical depression, a lot of times, it could, it could be ten times out of ten, it's not coming because they're trying to be mean to you. They don't hate you. They don't dislike you. They can't help it. It's, it's, it's almost an uncontrollable thing. They don't realize they're snapping at you when you talk to them. You ask a simple question, you get snapped at for no reason. Try not to have that knee-jerk reaction to where you snap right back. I wish I'd known this a long time ago, and I need to be better at it now because I'm still not great at this. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir with this. Try to be understanding and not react negatively. All it does is make them feel worse, it makes you feel bad, and it creates a barrier between the two of you that is hard to break down. And when that happens, one of the ways you can do your reaction or lack of reaction to a negative situation like that is just to be quiet, just to be, or calm at least, and avoid accusatory remarks or digs. One of the things, and I, I still do this from time to time, and once it's out of my mouth, I think, Michael, why did you go there? My wife takes a pill daily. If she doesn't take her pill, you can see the difference. So when she says something I don't particularly like or I feel like it was a jab at me, from time to time I'll say, did you take your pill today? Or you didn't take your pill today, did you? On the surface, that may seem like an honest question. It's not. When it comes out as a reaction to a negative situation, all it is is accusatory and it's a dig at the other person intended to make them feel bad. Instead of saying, did you take your pill today? Why not try going over to them 
and saying, I need a hug. They don't have to tell you they need a hug. I can promise you if they're going through the situation, they need a hug. But just go over and embrace them. Tell them you love them. Now, I'm, I'm coming, this, coming at this from my wife's point of view and my, me as a husband. So, you know, if, if your buddy Bubba <laughs> does this, it'll be a whole different circumstance. You don't want to go embrace Bubba and say, I need a hug, Bubba. I don't know why I automatically went to Forrest Gump there, but I did. So that was my next point, though. After avoiding accusatory remarks and taking digs at them, you might consider applying a little physical contact as best as possible. Again, with a husband and wife, a hug is easy or a kiss. It makes all the difference in the world. And that goes also for children. If you have children who suffer from clinical depression, they really need that physical contact. We don't realize it because a lot of times when that's going on, you don't feel like giving a hug or giving a kiss. You don't want to be touched. You don't want to touch. You don't want to show love to someone who is being bitter toward you, even if you know that it's coming from a place that they really can't help. We need to be understanding as people who live with people who suffer from clinical depression. Depression. They're not trying to hurt us. They are trying to get through this muck and this mire of something that's going on inside of them emotionally that they don't want any more than we do. They don't want to be looked at as someone who's snippy or negative. And it's knowing that people are looking at them that way that makes it worse. So we do not need to be a source of that. We need to be a source of support and strength and positive. We need to balance them out. I think that may be one of the reasons God put me with Kayla, so I could balance her out because I'm so positive. So when she's having one of these situations and the symptoms are happening and she's feeling helpless because of it, when I react toward her negatively without understanding, it just makes the situation worse. Try to be positive. Try not to be accusatory. Give them some physical contact. Understand that it's not coming from a place of ill will toward you. It's coming from a place of struggle inside them. And they don't feel like, they feel like they're suffocating. They feel like their feet won't move. If you ask someone who suffers clinical depression on the days they don't feel like getting out of bed, it's not that they're being lazy. It's that they, they really don't feel like they could take three steps without falling down. It lays on them that heavily. And they don't want it any more than we do. They don't enjoy it. They're not wallowing in laziness and self-pity. They would love to break out of it, but they can't without help. And while medications are great for those of us who are living with someone with clinical depression, it is up to us to do what the pills cannot. The pill can help with the chemical imbalance, but it cannot provide a hug. It can't provide a kiss. It can't provide that understanding that they need. And they're not going to get it from everybody. So what I'm hoping is that anybody that hears this, anybody within the sound of my voice that hears this, that deals with this situation, at least you can be someone who can make a difference in the life of these people. Can you tell I'm passionate about it? I need you to allow them to work through their symptoms. Don't try to fix it. A lot of times when something happens with my wife, and this is a man-woman thing anyway, the woman comes home, or the man comes home, the, the wife has had a hard day, and she just needs to vent. She just needs to talk about it and have someone listen and say, I'm sorry. She doesn't need you to fix it for her. Well, it's the same thing with someone who suffers clinical depression. They don't necessarily need, need you to fix it for them, but if they have trusted you, and believe me, trust is a big deal. If someone who suffers from clinical depression trusts you enough to bend your ear, that's a big thing. That really means they highly regard you. Respect that and give them the ear that they're looking for. Don't try to fix it for them. What they're doing is they're looking for an outlet to work through this, to be able to manage it. And they're hoping that you can help them and prop them up. So don't try to fix it. Just be there for them and understand where they're coming from and let them work through it themselves. And then be their strength and support. I've, I've said that a couple of times, but it's important enough to be a bullet point. 
you may have to be their back, their legs, their heart. You may have to be there for them and give a portion of yourself to them in order to provide them strength and support. They need that from you. A lot of times, maybe even most times, they won't ask you for it. That's why it's important for you to recognize it so that you know when to offer it. A lot of times when someone's feeling this way, the reason they're curled up in a little ball is because they don't want to bother anybody with their problems. They don't even understand it themselves. They don't know why. They don't want to have to answer a bunch of questions as to why, because they can't. So if you know someone who suffers from this and you're recognizing that they're going through a bout, if they're going through a battle or a struggle with clinical depression, try to be there for them. Don't come running to the rescue like Superman and saying, you're going through clinical depression. This looks like a job for me. Hey, have you taken your pill? Here, let me fix that for you. That's not what they're looking for. When you recognize a battle, you step up to the front. You say, I love you. I'm here for you. Do you want to talk about it? If not, say, okay. Do you want me to stay here with you? If not, okay, let me know what I can do for you. And it's not always going to be somebody curled up in a ball. I mean, I mean, we're talking about the symptoms can materialize in any sort and, or any myriad of different ways. It's just whenever it does materialize, you recognize it, you understand it, and you come at it from a position of love, not from a position of defense. I hope this has helped you. I, I really do. I, I hope this is something that can be beneficial to somebody, if especially someone, yeah, people who might need to recognize that they need to get help themselves, but as someone who has dealt with this before, knowing what to look for, knowing how to handle it, even though I don't handle it the best way possible every time, knowing how to has helped me to grow and has helped me to help my wife in fundamental, wonderful ways. And I keep growing in that direction and I hope you will too. I hope you will take this and say, yeah, that person that I know, maybe I have been a little standoffish because I don't like the way it makes me feel when I have to deal with them when they're going through their symptoms. Instead, maybe you're telling yourself now, no, I wanna understand and I wanna be that person that can be the shoulder of support. You know, you'll get a blessing from it, and you'll bless them as well. That's this episode of Road Noises, episode number 18. If you've got something you'd like to tell me about, I really would love to hear your stories. I would love to be a part of your life and get a relationship going with you. But you, to do that, you've got to get in touch with me. Now, I've got a new email address. The old one still works, but I'm not really checking it. I do have a new email address. It is feedback at michaelblackston.com. That's feedback at michaelblackston.com. You can go to michaelblackston.com right now and read my comedy blog. I'd love to see you there. Leave a comment. And you can also catch us at roadnoisepodcast.com and facebook.com slash roadnoisepodcast. I have a hotline you can call as well at 706-389-0401. And like me on Twitter or follow me. Not like me. Follow me on Twitter at EverythingArts. So until the next episode, I'm Michael Blackston. Thanks for riding along with me in the passenger seat, joining me on my commute for road noise as we learn to live life one mile at a time.